Um, since we're waiting for people to come in, um, I'm just going to start off with a brief introduction and um, introduce the speakers and the Polis Project and the Descent in Dangerous Times lecture series. Um, I'm Suchitra Vijayan. I'm a lawyer and a writer, uh, and I'm a founding member of the Humanities Collective Polis Project. Um, we are a collective of writers, um, artists, photographers who come together um, to produce work about um, empire, militarization, post-colony, and the trajectories of war. And the Descent in Dangerous Times lecture series is our public face in New York. And it's also a way for us to have conversations about things that truly matter in a way that is um, not shallow, not banal, but something that is substantial and something that can drive um, conversation and also dissent. And also it's our um, opportunity to disagree with each other and move forward. Um, and before I start, um, I would like to thank a few people. Um, I would like to thank Hamad Sindhi and Jeremy Randall, um, without whose generosity we will not have this lecture series. So this is the third of our lecture series, and when I first reached out to them, they said yes. So without their ability then and the generosity, we would not be ha having this. Um, second, I also wanted to thank Michael Broner for making <laughs> the connection with uh, Mahamadu uh, and then making this event possible in a way so that we not only have Kalyan um, have the lecture, but also have uh, the author of this remarkable book, Guantanamo Diaries, join, on, join in. Uh, we also have Larry Seams, who's the editor of Guantanamo Diaries, joining in, uh, who not only made the publication of the book possible, but also in some ways, um, with his inventive ways, made the redactions themselves be another voice and speak about it. Um, for me, Guantanamo Diary is more than just a book. It's not just a humane manifestation of what happens to someone who holds on to their humanity, but also it's an indictment of the US empire in so many ways. Um, the first day when I book picked up this book was a very intense day for me because just the day before, um, someone I had known who was Iraqi refugee living in Cairo um, had left Cairo and gone back to Iraq. And his daughter called crying, saying that her father had passed away. And this was someone who I had helped um, do the refugee petition and failed miserably. Um, just on the morning of the day that I picked up the book, another friend called and said that there was an attack in Kabul. And again, um, there was no report except <clears throat> an AFP report that said, oh yes, um, 120 civilians had died. And it was not just about um, expats who could leave Kabul in any moment's notice, but it's also about Afghans who had lived through what was perpetual hell and perpetual war for all these years. And end of the day, um, when I did pick up the book, um, there is this incredible uh, introduction in which Larry Seems says, 13 years ago, Mohamedou left his home in um, Mauritiana and then drove to the headquarters of his national, uh, drove to the headquarters of his national police for questioning. He has not returned home. For our collective sense of story and of justice, we must have a clear understanding of why this has not happened yet and what will happen next. Since then, Mohamedou has been released, but I think the question, what will happen next, is still important today. Um, with that, I will quickly do a quick introduction of Kalyan, who is our speaker today. Uh, Kalyan is a visiting professor, uh, visiting assistant professor in history at Haverford College and received a PhD in English from the University of Pennsylvania. His articles and book reviews have appeared or are forthcoming in the novel um, A Forum on Fiction, Textual Practice, South Asia Review, and 21st Century Literature. His poetry is forthcoming in the margins and he is the editor at large of Cleaver Magazine. He is currently at work on a scholarly monograph on race, labor, and contemporary multi-ethnic American literature. And I'm really glad that all of you made it today. Thank you. Thanks, uh, uh Firstly, thank you, Sujitra, and the Polis Project for inviting me for this uh, incredible opportunity, really, to uh, be able to talk to all of you, but also to talk to Mamadou. Thank you for joining us. Um, Larry, thank thanks for being here, Michael. Uh, and uh, I, I'll start off by saying that uh, I uh, am a sort of literary historian and a formalist. And I, when, I, when I picked up this book uh, in, Jan, uh, in March 2015, to be precise, um, I had no idea that it would grip me as much as it did. Um, um, I had read a, a series of uh, reviews of the, of the book, and I wasn't sure uh, what I'd get into when I when I when I started reading the book, but I was really gripped by the voice of of Mamadou. Um, and uh, since then, I've been um, 
uh, working with this book and a few others, um, and I'll, I'll talk more about that. Uh, and I'm hoping what this uh, talk will do today is kind of open up the conversation uh, from the way I'm thinking about it to like how you're all processing the book, um, and and we can essentially have a, a great conversation maybe about um, what it means, what this book means in in this particular um, historical moment that we're living through. So my talk today is called um, Subject Redacted, 9-11 and the Silent Space of Dissent. In a recent exhibition called Ode to the Sea, eight Guantanamo detainees showcased their paintings and sculptures at uh, the President's Gallery uh, in CUNY's John Jay Library, uh, College of Criminal Justice. It's still on, you can uh, go check it out till January 2018. These paintings offer a variety of scenes, most of them seascapes uh, in some form or another, this one, um, you can see here by Anmar al-Baluchi, is of a deserted beach. Uh, it's called Seashore. Then this one by Ghalib al-Bihani is of a cityscape in the distance uh, with what is essentially a global city in the background, perhaps. There are others like uh, Muhammad Ansi's um, painting there, as well as Sabri Muhammad uh, Iqbal al Qureshi's painting, drown, uh, untitled Drow uh, The Drowning Statue of Liberty. So um, in, the, in the second painting of the Li Liberty statue, what is striking is that Lady Liberty is drowning, an apt metaphor for the extra legal limbo that these men have endured or continue to endure. But these paintings are even more remarkable if we consider the fact that, as former detainee uh, Mansoor Adaifi notes, um, the artists, um, in, uh, the artists at Guantanamo never got a glimpse of the sea. It was hard not seeing the sea, despite its being only a few hundred feet away from us. At the recreation area, if we lay on our stomach, we could get glimpses of the sea through small openings below the tarp. When the guards found out, they blocked the openings. Tethered in, to the floor with heavy chains, the artists of this ex exhibition are united in the militarized sensory deprivation and isolation that is Guantanamo. The exhibit presents uh, paintings that ask a difficult question of the American nation, mainly who pays the price for American freedom. The dystopia is only heightened if we consider the stamp on uh, the reverse of uh, one of the paintings approved by the US forces. What does it mean to express oneself and one's discontent under the watchful gaze of your captors? These paintings present a terrible proposition that detainment, um, that their production emerges as both a form of temporary escape from indefinite detainment and a grim placeholder for civil society to witness their detainment. These paintings also visualize the experience of reading Muhammad, Muhammadu Ul Slahi's heavily redacted first edition of Guantanamo Diary which is occasionally like having to contort one's mind to glimpse the psychic conditions that govern the prison island. Abducted from his home country in Mauritania not long before 9-11, Salahi went on an endless world tour from prisons in Jordan, Bagram, and then finally to Guantanamo, accused of being an Al-Qaeda recruiter in 1992 and thereafter, as well as the mastermind behind the LAX airplane plot um, that is also called the Millennium, Millennium Plot. And these took on various permutations and combinations. Long withheld from the public as a form of presumptive classifications, uh, Salahi's memoir was first released in 2015, covered over with more than 2,500 redactions that editor Larry Seams um, kept intact for its publication. Seams also added crucial footnotes for many redactions, uh, decoding and collecting data meticulously uh, pieced together from public re record. Salahi's work has been called a document of historic importance by Pan America and has been received with critical acclaim in many countries. About a year and a half after the book's publication, Salahi was released from Guantanamo because of a persistent lack of evidence. A year, year after that, uh, on the first anniversary of his uh, return uh, to Mauritania, uh, the classification was lifted and Salahi published the restored and unredacted version of Guantanamo Diary, which was essentially published two weeks ago, um, October 17th. So here you can see uh, both the, uh, the redacted version on the right side and the uh, one with the redactions lifted, which I'm going to 
talk about why that's there in a second. Um, his diary is a devastating and urgent consideration of censorship and the stakes of dissent in uh, post 9-11 era. The redacted form, as well as unredacted content of the 2015 memoir, uh, produces in insistent questions about the biopolitics of dissent. The strate strategic inclusion of the redactions creates a literary device wittingly co-authored by US military censors, the one on the right. I argue that far from um, silencing uh, Salahi's narrative, the blank space of redaction amplifies the grimness of American militarism and its regime of Islamophobia. You might ask, why not read the restored edition, one that Salahi and his legal team have fought so hard to extricate from classification? I suggest that we stay with the redacted version just a little more for the formal clarity it offers in understanding the uh, concepts of sovereignty and citizenship. The importance of the redactions to both author and editor are certainly amplified, uh, are certainly implied, sorry, by their choice to keep a trace of the redactions intact through shaded portions uh, that both allow us to read the text behind the redactions and remind us of, the, of its censorship history. They also remind us uh, about the longevity of 9-11 of and the state of perpetual war that the US has entered, one that has cost taxpayers a staggering $1.46 trillion over the last 16 years. Reading around these unreadable black bars offers uh, as crucial insight into the regime of silence and sovereign violence that has marked um, our period. Legal scholar Letty Wolf notes that a remarkable shift in the aftermath of 9-11 uh, consolidated a public and political consensus about racial profiling where Middle Eastern, Arab, and Muslim populations were identified as terrorists and then disidentified as citizens. Extra-legal racial profiling became a social norm resulting in over a thousand incidents of violence, homes, businesses, mosques, temples, and gurdwaras firebombed, individuals attacked with guns, knives, fists, and words, women with headscarves beaten, pushed off buses, spat on, children in schools harassed by parents of other children, by classmates, and by teachers. The extra-legal racial profiling of Muslims at home had an even more insidious double, that of the extra-legal detainment of non-American global Muslims. After a period of housing Haitian and Cuban refugees in the 1990s, Guantanamo Bay was re-established re as a detention camp in 2002 with the US government only acknowledging as late as 2006 that the camp had processed 779 prisoners of about 50 nationalities. Under the Obama administration, the number has reduced from 245 to 41. Um, this was as of January 19, 2017. Yet representations of 9-11 have not kept pace with the global repercussions of the war on terror. Canonical repre representations of 9-11 have concentrated on complicating the question of American innocence, of course, but works like uh, Jonathan Safran Foer's uh, Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close, John Updike's The Terrorist, Claire Massoud's The Emperor's Children, Don DeLillo's Falling Man, and Joseph O'Neill's Netherland all describe 9-11 as an event that raises many questions about America's self-projection of innocence, the for uh, foreign militarism, um, and its assumed global leadership. However, they've paid less attention, and sometimes no attention, to how the global Muslim body has been caught in the dragnet of the security state. In fact, far from addressing either the ethnic American or global Muslim subject, American, liter uh, American uh, literary writing about the event has been skewed in terms of racial representation, where mainstream American authors prefer to articulate the ex existential doubt and dread experienced by mainly white American citizens. Bruce Robbins argues that post-9-11 American novel, novels have taken an inward turn, retreating into spaces of domesticity. Robbins' central critique is that post-9-11 novels tend to overlook continuing American injustices at home, recreating a neo-imperial and often unwittingly nationalist um, narrative of blame. My approach to the diary today will primarily be that of a literary historian and a formalist. I'm in the process of writing a larger project uh, that I'm calling Provincializing 9-11, which reads Salahi, poets like Sulma Sharif, novelists like Kamila Shamsi, Salman Rushdie, and Purchista Khakpur, um, as key writers redescribing the narrative hold of 9-11 as a distinctly American phenomenon. Using uh, formal techniques like magical realism, poetic silence, and bureaucratic redaction, writers construct alternate genealogies of terror that radiate outwards 
to um, other uh, parts of the world, like South Asia, the Middle East, and West Africa. As scholars like Baki Rothimani, Kavita Daya, and Indrapra Greval have suggested, it is of utmost urgency to both challenge and undo narratives of American hegemony. The importance and urgency of Guantanamo Diary um, is quite self-evident. It has been, uh, it has not only topped a bestseller list that has, and, and, and it has also become a staple feature of courses across American universities on literatures of 9-11. The text offers a highly uh, unusual departure from other 9-11 narratives for many reasons. Firstly, because as you all know, Salahi has intimately witnessed American excesses at Guantanamo. Secondly, his narrative is an open-ended testimony, one that records the truth that most popular narratives um, are uh, extremely, um, one that popular narratives are, are sort of skillfully evade or underplay. Salahi's narrative could be thought of as what Liram Midovoy calls a form of world system literature, where the narrative emerges outside of uh, the American nation, but is nonetheless addressed to an American audience. The redactions in the memoir serve to obliterate so much material that Salahi refers to first seeing the, the public manuscript as broken goods. Larry Seams notes that they obscure the author's openness while reminding us on every page on how much we have yet to see. At the same time, US censors have unwittingly highlighted a narrative of broken form, one that offers crucial insights into the representation of endless extra-legal internment. Moreover, they call attention to how the war on terror has played out uh, aggressively as a media spectrum uh, in, in, an in a sort of definitely, uh, definitively visual register. Yogita Goel observes that images of nighttime bombing, raids of cities in Iraq, tanks in the streets, bodies strewn on the ground, drone strikes in Pakistan, Afghanistan, Yemen, and Somalia, and the resonant imagery of significant events like George Bush's Mission Accomplished banner uh, on, the, on, on television, on television the, the sort of televised capture of Saddam Hussein, and uh, the inspection of his mouth, have tried to counteract the narrative uh, inaugurated by the spectacle of the falling World Trade Center. In an uh, overdetermined visual culture of shock and awe, scholars and artists have turned their attention to bringing visibility to the realities that have been censored out of the central narrative of 9-11. Focusing on the redacted version of Sly's memoir demands that we pay attention to what remains visible in spite, and perhaps because of, state censorship. What remains visible despite the black power is immensely generative and revealing about the representation of dissent within an evolving military industrial complex. So the reductions are many things, um, but perhaps we can begin with thinking about the, the site of the memoir's composition, Guantanamo. Officially leased by the US uh, in 1903 after uh, the Spanish-American War for the purpose of building uh, coaling and naval stations, Guantanamo Bay has been both an uh, island of strategic importance in the 20th century and has occupied a state of empty sovereignty. Amy Kaplan historicizes a revealing portrait of the bizarre nature of American imperialism in the Caribbean. While the island is technically leased by the US government from Cuba in perpetuity, uh, Cuba cannot legally evict uh, the US unless the US abandons the site. This was in line with the Platt Amendment that granted broad powers to the US in exchange for Cuban independence. In 1959, long after the amendment ended, Fidel Castro tried to evict the US, but only succeeded in uh, cutting the water supply and creating a, a sort of field of deserts around the base. Um, every year, the government sends a check of $4,085 to Cuba, uh, roughly the equivalent of 2,000 gold coins um, at the sort of beginning of the 20th century which the Cuban government does not deposit as a protest against US occupation. Kaplan observes that Guantanamo is not clearly under the sovereignty of either the US or Cuba, nor seemingly subject to national and international law. This political quandary begs her rhetorical question, where in the world is Guantanamo? The island's geopolitical fuzziness is at the heart of American empire, uh, a dominion at once rooted in specific locales and dispersed unevenly all over the world. The extra-legal methods of the global war on terror also have another important prehistory within the American nation, that of Japanese internment during World War II. 
after the attack on Pearl Harbor, FDR signed the infamous ex ex Executive Order 9066 that turned Japanese Americans into enemy aliens uh, based solely on their ancestry. Uh, rounding, both, rounding up both Japanese citizens and non-citizens, American government, uh, the American government shifted thousands into relocation camps in remote regions around the country. When Fred Korematsu eventually challenged the government's exclusion orders, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of up upholding uh, Japanese exclusion, bristling at the suggestion that the relocation camps were concentration camps. Justice Murphy infamously opined that the ruling against Korematsu arose out of a military imperative. Citizenship has its responsibilities as well as its privileges, and in times of war, the burden uh, is always heavier, he said. In the post-9-11 era, this burden of citizenship uh, has, uh, during, the, during the sort of time of perpetual war, has expanded indefinitely to include non-citizens. Coming back to the redactions in Guantanamo Diary, ascribing formal uh, causality to them is often impaired by the fact that they seem to have little desire to obliterate, um, uh, that they have almost a willful desire to uh, obliterate its specificity. They're whimsical and without purpose, um, and often um, have wild contradictions. Nonetheless, the absence has also produced a curious resonance that unifies the narrative core's, narrative's core dilemma, that of the production of unfreedom at the heart of a massive, um, at the hands of a massive uh, system of surveillance. So now take, for example, these two. Um, I'm just going to, I think I've missed a slide there. But uh, essentially, take, for example, uh, the fact that there are these two really different um, uh, situations of interrogation. Uh, I'm just going to read out one of, one of the bits, and you can see what, what's happening here. Um, I don't know, redacted, answered. Redacted was a respectable redacted. And I very much respected redacted, honesty. Redacted was appointed to torture me, but redacted ultimately failed, which led to redacted separation from my case. To me, redacted was an evil person. Redacted always laughed sardonically. And so what happens is you have two different inter interrogators in this, in this particular uh, segment, um, and you don't quite know the difference between the two because their names uh, have been redacted. One of them as we'll find out in, in this edition, is Colonel Ronica, who's the uh, benevolent one. And then there's uh, Samantha, who's the more sadistic one. And uh, both seem to have, uh, it's unclear whether their names are actually real. And, and, and in each case, um, what happens really is that um, the US censors uh, find ways to obliterate um, any sort of uh, sense of who the interrogators are, including sometimes self-styled mo self, self monikers that guards derive from Star Wars. Um, they, inst as a result, they author a telling uh, global homogeneity that illustrates the reach of American power. For example, one of the Jor Jordanian guards, um, whom uh, Salahi nicknames Mr. Satan, um, is also redacted. And it's a name that we actually never uh, see. So there's a kind of homogeneity that is created between these various inter interrogators, because we never get to see their names. However, the accumulation of black bars um, um, also illustrates um, that there's a certain kind of claustrophobia and disorientation in size experience, uh, projecting a slew of faceless, nameless characters who exist on a spectrum from benevolent to malevolent. Larry Seams suggests that the redactions are, in fact, essential tools of secrecy. Similarly, Neil Krishna Garwal connects the redactions as a method of expunging uh, agency accountability for the indiscriminate use of torture. What they do is provide a chance for an ironic reversal of state power by reading against the grain. While the proper nouns and military designations are predictably away, they also introduce forms of uncertainty that function like ellipses. While an ellipsis is traditionally used in poetry to create meaningful silences, uh, where the omission of words introduces an aesthetic question, the redactions hyperbolize the political stakes and vacuum of Silahi's narrative. So, you can see here this and this, the sort of blank wall of, um, 
um, an inter insurmountable wall of silence that they, they present to us. And they dramatize the loss of control experienced by the narrator, transferring it to our reading experience. These gaps complement Salahi's occasional second person address to the dear reader. The redactions provide an affective counterpart to his uh, imagined mainly American um, audience. How does it feel to realize that you are not being presented with the truth, they seem to be asking? What does it feel like to remain in the dark, as he once uh, speculates? Furthermore, the US government's desire to silence Salahi only heightens what the author calls his compulsion to write. While the accounts could be classified in what Helena Grease and uh, Tim Woods call uh, literatures of captivity, uh, Guantanamo Diary also departs from many of the hallmark features of survivor accounts. For one, the diary emerges from within the military industrial complex and was first released during Salahi's detention. Um, a lot of the times these survivor accounts are released afterwards. Right? Uh, for another, the diary has been lauded for its remarkable <coughs> sense of humor and equanimity. <coughs> Grease and Woods suggest that literatures of captivity often uh, remain oddly measured and virtually devoid of emotion. Similarly, Kate Douglas suggests that graphic details of physical abuse are used to speak for, um, for the traumatized author slash victim, but often in a flattened narrative voice that lists atrocities without uh, commenting specifically upon them. In contrast, Salahi provides a form of both empathetic and angry testimony that uses writing as a form of both resistance and reflection. The introduction um, to his restored edition uh, of Guantanamo Diary, Salahi tells us how the writing has always been a, a habitual act for him. I also developed a minor compulsion for writing. I could write things down anywhere and everywhere, random things I sometimes wouldn't even remember writing. More than once, I was embarrassed when friends found uh, my intimate ideas often scribbled in notebooks and even in the margins of my school books. This compulsion, it turned out, didn't even require a pen. It got so, uh, this, it, it, it got so I would trace my thoughts with my finger on my thigh or in the air by my side. In Guantanamo, this drove my interrogators crazy. They did everything to stop me from writing with my finger or on my body. Little did, I, did they know that most of the time I wasn't even aware that I was doing it. I wanted to comply, but I just couldn't. Their solution was to chain my hands tightly at my sides, making it impossible for me to write on my legs. But my fingers kept moving anyway. Even if you succeed in shutting me up, I go on writing. And this, this moment that he refers to about chaining his hands to the side actually sort of is, it does happen in the diary as well. Uh, sort of the moment where that, that, that mirrors there's that moment as well. The compulsion to write offers an uh, uncomfortably close look at what Elaine Scarry theorizes as the body in pain. In scenes of both mental and physical torture, pain not only becomes a metaphor for the violation of the basic right um, to be unharmed, but also a synonym for power. Writing offers Salahi a form of continued dissent, one that takes on an unconscious form of unruliness. The central irony, as the text reveals in the last portion of the memoir that spans the period uh, from 2003 to 2005, is that Salahi's indefatigable ability to generate writing also coincides with the US government's desire for a detailed confession. After his exposure to repeated interrogations, followed by an intensive regime of torture, um, the infamous EIT, or Enhanced Interrogation Tactics, sanctioned by Don Donald Rumsfeld, especially for Salahi, um, he begins offering wild theories to ease the conditions of his detainment. The confessions that US interrogators get out of him are not merely information they do not have, but that of information they would like to have, information that confirms not facts, but prejudices about the enemy combatant. As Salahi notes, uh, I wrote more than a 1,000 pages about my friends with false information. I had to wear the suit the US intel tailored for me, and that is exactly what I did. The redactions dramatize the editorialized nature of the war on terror and the US government's obsessive desire to find culpability. If the story doesn't uh, have a consistent voice or doesn't match US intel, the interrogator exhorts Salahi, like a good professor of, of creative writing, to revise his story for consistency. The information that Salahi is meant to provide operates in a domain of racialization that testifies to the extraterritorial and extralegal nature of his detainment. 
interrogations also reveal a familiar insistence on American innocence where the raced suspect must confess his crimes against the nation for any hope of redemption. Let's see if I got the right slide. Ah, here it is. So here you can see it inaugurates a model of speculation that insists on the guilt being known in advance of evidence or confession. You're Arabic, you're young, you went to jihad, you speak foreign languages, you've been in many countries, you're a graduate in a technical discipline, and what crime is that, I said. Look at the hijackers, they were the same way. All you have to say is, I don't remember, I don't know, I've done nothing. You think you're going to impress an American jury with those words? In the eyes of the Americans, you're doomed. Just looking at you in an orange suit, chains, and being Muslim in Arabic is enough to convict you. This line of questioning and interrogation racializes him as an enemy alien open to the endless violence of the state. However, the fact that he remains outside of the civil rights of American citizenship, and, and Salahi keeps asking them, um, uh, telling them that he's not an American citizen, uh, and therefore uh, they have no sovereignty over him, he still somehow uh, is placed within the realm of American sovereignty by the US state. As with the history of Asiatic exclusion in the early 20th century, it places him in an oppositional matrix from the American citizen. The conditions of international law, however, require that the enemy combatant is treated within the framework of the Geneva Convention. On February 7, 2002, President Bush noted in a memorandum um, that Al-Qaeda and operating members were, were outside of the Geneva Convention because Geneva applies to conflicts involving high contracting parties, which can only be states. Uh, it assumes the existence of regular armed forces fighting on behalf of states. Bush notes that the war on terrorism ushers in a new paradigm, one in which groups with broad international reach commit horrific acts, signaling uh, in policy form what we know as the whole you're either with us or against us speech. He asks for new thinking in the laws of war. The ensuing classification of terrorism of terrorists as unlawful enemy combatants, though of course gestured to in the Geneva Convention but never explicitly uh, mentioned, puts the detainees out of reach of both domestic and international law, in, and putting them instead in a limbo that is distinctly extraterritorial, one that Giorgio Dombin, the Italian philosopher, theorizes as a state of exception. A state of exception, of course, is a mode of emergency marked by the suspension of the sovereign in order to protect the law. In Homo Sacer, Agamben theorizes via Aristotle that the foundation of Western political life involves the separation of natural life, zoe, and the, a form of political life, bios. The split between the two is resolved by giving over natural life to sovereign force. Agamben sees this split uh, appearing, for instance, in human rights discourse, where the rights of man and citizen are only consolidated in the political life of the citizen um, and the exclusion of figures like the stateless refugee. With Guantanamo, the statelessness of the detainee uh, assumes a tricky dimension, one that certainly excludes the enemy from the national, uh, literally removed from the nation, but it is for the safety of the American citizen that Salahi is meant to confess the litany of fictions fed to him by interrogators. As Chandan Ned Reddy uh, notes in uh, Freedom Without Violence, the discourse of security requires the configuration of the terrorist as the racialized and sexualized other of the citizen. The terrorist becomes indistinguishable uh, from uh, any formation that seeks to contest the welfare of the US citizen, in whose name the state survives. Um, it is this discursive regime of the citizen as an absolute horizon where the protection of civil right ratifies the torture of the enemy combatant. Not unlike the colonial Filipino ward of the early 20th century, the subject of the American security state finds himself in a condition of servitude and vulnerability that places him on the inverse side of citizenship. Salahi's persecutors at the level of the individual, the national, the extraterritorial, are convinced that he exists outside of any conventional law requiring perhaps an updated term for a perpetual condition of global vulnerability uh, in the exercise of American sovereignty. While many uh, political theorists have brought, uh, have broached and brought Guantanamo to light in the Agambian notion of bare life and the state of exception, I would like to suggest a complementary formation 
uh, that uh, one that pays attention to both the exceptionality of the state of exception, but also keeps in mind its normalizing um, as indefinite detention. While Agamben's notion of the state of exception appears in the form of a camp that accounts for the concentration camp of Nazi Germany, which is a gap that he suggests uh, neither Michel Foucault nor Hannah Arendt uh, fully address, reckoning with Guantanamo requires thinking about the camp as nationalizing the state of exception. And then how do we begin thinking about a voice that dissents against its classification as bare life? Salahi's narrative forces a confrontation with what I'm calling the figure of the uncitizen, a distinctly rights-ridden individual by Salahi's own theorizing, akin to the American tradition of the slave, intimately and brutally bound to the continuing welfare of the American citizen. While the reductions are constantly at pains to reduce him to the status of bare life, um, that is a kind of an, a natural life in, in sort of Adamman's formation, uh, Salahi voices the condition of his internment as uh, a question to the fiction of the citizen. The redactions signal the total dominion uh, of biopolitics, where every unsanctioned, unsanctioned utterance has the capacity to upset the sovereign. However, the editorial inclusion of the black bar breaks the fiction of the seamless administration of the state of exception. Despite interrupting Salahi's narrative, the black bar makes visible what is glossed in the fiction of citizenship, that individuals, both within and outside the nation, are not merely included or excluded from entry, but actively unmade in the name of the sovereign. The condition of the uncitizen is that he or she remains negatively tethered to the concept of, of the citizen. The redaction produces uh, a textual representation of Salahi's unfreedom, where only those parts of himself that are inconsequential to the state remain open to the public. In fact, Salahi, despite his mistreatment, must be acknowledged as a living person, however begrudgingly, um, as bare life that can certainly be exposed to, the, uh, to death, but cannot be exterminated. The doctors and medic medics at hand uh, show us, even at their most unethical moments, that they must keep him alive on the edge of human life. Salahi notes sarcastically that the American interrogators congratulate themselves for their self-proclaimed humanity, even as dictatorial countries uh, do pretty much the same, keeping prisoners out of, uh, alive out of necessity. When Salahi demands that he is uh, informed of his crimes, he only receives the vague answer of national security, which not only signals the failure of the American interrogator rec to recognize his Mauritanian citizenship, but the globalized, uh, uh, but the globalized uh, concept of American sovereignty. The foreign uncitizen has no access to rights in constitutional American law. He cannot, for instance, seek equal protections under the 14th Amendment, as Fred Korematsu once did during the Second World War. But he is duty bound uh, constantly through the exceptionality of 9 11 to confess his extra juridical crimes in the interest of the safety of the American citizen. So the initial rulings at the appellate courts from Rasul versus Bush 2004 and Hamdan versus Rumsfeld 2006 uh, illuminate, uh, init at least initially, just how uh, difficult it is for the detainee to uh, to uh, actually write the petition of uh, to actually hand in the petition of habeas corpus, uh, which was essentially initially rejected because uh, the court said the detainees had no cognizable constitutional rights, and this was later overturned by the Supreme Court. In the period before his internment in 2000, um, Senegalese, inter uh, Senegalese interrogator asked Salahi questions about his position towards the US and why he had transited, transited to this country. Salahi expresses his bafflement with this line of question, asking, I really don't, didn't understand why my position toward the US government should matter to anybody. I'm not a US citizen, nor did I apply to enter the US, nor am I working with the UN. Besides, I could always lie, or say, let's say I love the US or I hate it. It doesn't really matter as long as I haven't done any crimes against the US. His frustration echoed by many Muslims who continue to get pulled aside for uh, private screenings at airports uh, and more gives voice to a global uh, condition of, of the American security state where multiple countries become ventriloquized uh, in the interest of American democracy. I'd like to end today uh, with a, a coda, essentially, from an artist whose work uh, reorients the miniaturization of textuality as an aesthetic approach. 
in her debut collection, um, Look, Iranian American poet Solma Sharif reconfigures the blank space of redaction by using bureaucratic vocabulary from the US Department of Defense, Diction uh, uh, Defense Dictionary of Military and Associated Terms. Like Salahi, uh, Sharif meditates on the brutal intimacy naturalized by America's perpetual wars. The title of the collection, Look, refers to mine warfare, mainly a period during which a mine circuit is receptive of an influence, the influence here being a person and their instant obliteration. In a poem titled Safe House, let's see here, Sharif offers a portrait of talking to her father, sanctuary, where we don't have to sanitize hands or words or knives, we don't have to use a scale each morning, worried we take up too much space. I scan my memory of Baba talking on screen, answering a question, how are you? I would ask and ask from behind the camera, his face changing with each repetition as he tried to watch the football game. He doesn't know this is the beginning of my scribing life, repetition and change. Sharif intensifies the language of militarized bureaucracy by reenacting its metaphorical meanings. While the poem describes a moment of familial bonding with her father, the simultaneous definition from the DOD dictionary shifts the scene. In the dictionary, the phrase safe house is defined as an innocent appearing house or premises established by an organization for the purpose of conducting clandestine or covert activity in relative security. Similarly, screening refers to the evaluation of an individual or a group of individuals to determine their potential to answer collection requirements. What should be a scene between a daughter and a father is irrevocably changed now charged with a strategically violent vocabulary of war. Interestingly, not all words appear in the current version of the dictionary. Now, Sharif explains, explains this discre discrepancy as a feature of the constantly revised nature of the DOD's dictionary, which she stabilizes by restricting her usage in look to the October 17, 2007 version. You can no longer find words like drone or look or scan or even scribing. They've been, as she helpfully tells us, uh, removed from the dictionary since understanding of the term has fully entered English vernacular. In other words, the military definition is no longer a supplement to the English language, but the <coughs> English language itself. Thus, if military terminology uses language as both cover and vehicle for describing and perfecting violence, then uh, Sharif blows that cover with little markers of disruption. In the poem, each capitalized word disrupts the smooth flow of poetic speech by introducing uh, artificial constraints that function like implosions implied in other poems such as look or a drone strike implied in a poem called drone. If the intent behind military redactions is to cloak information with silence, then Sharif turns silence into language that can be critiqued and circulated within public discourse. The capitalizations bring accountability to the euphemisms of military operations by making the violence legible. They cannot be glossed over uh, on the page, asking us to reckon with the weaponizing of the intimate and the everyday. Sharif shows us in ways that Muhammadu Ulslahi understands only too well, it matters what you call a thing. Or to rephrase Sharif slightly, it matters whom you call a thing. Thanks. Thank you. So I'm, before I open up to the audience, I'm kind of going to go back to Mohamedou and then come back and have a conversation. Um, Mohamedou, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, perfect. Um, Mohamedou, in, towards the end of Guantanamo Diary, you ask this question. You say, what do the American people think? I'm eager to know. Um, you wrote this when you were still incarcerated. You've been, um, it's been a year since you've been out, and I've kind of wanted you to um, respond to this question. What do the American people think, but also um, respond to Kalyan's um, reading of your work? Uh, first off, <clears throat> I'm very happy to be invited to this very beautiful uh, set with uh, you, Sutra, and uh, Kalyan. And thank you, Kalyan, for a very good 
expose. I don't know what it's called, but I would say expose. And uh, yeah, you see, I found myself in a very unique and completely weird situation. Mm -hmm. So when I was in school, in high school, uh, you know, we I had to choose between like mathematics, biology, and uh, literature. So, and I was, yeah, I did well in mathematics relatively. So, and in uh, Arabic, in languages. So, and then they told me, ah, you could uh, study literature or mathematics. But I figured, so, but mathematics, it's very easy because there is only one answer. There are, there are not too many answers. <laughs> so, and no one is going to cheat me. So I said, no, I do mathematics. <laughs> so I always want the life to be very simple. But every turn, at every turn, I had life much more complicated than I really wanted it to be. <laughs> and Guantanamo Bay was really the... <laughs> was completely crazy. So first, I'm the one who went to the police. I said, I'm here. I didn't do anything. I come to you. Because I figured, well, I know the US through movies like Law and Order and uh, Married with Children in Germany. So I said, America is cool. And there is no problem. So I will tell them, look, I didn't do anything. So let me be, let me go back to my goats and my camels. And uh, that was not easy. And uh, you know, Germans are uh, very wise, you know, notwithstanding <coughs> the uh, American common wisdom about them. So they say that, uh, I, I say what they said, and then I translate. They say, wenn das Militär sich bewegt, bleibt die Wahrheit auf der Strecke. When the military is in motion, uh, truth cannot keep up. So truth always stay behind because the military is too quick for uh, the, the truth. So I found myself in a very weird world where there is only one color, one narrative. And that narrative does not have to be true, but that narrative have has the most powerful country in the world behind it. They have the media, uh, they can put chain in me and they don't need to let me talk. And uh, so they have everything control 100% the narrative. But I said, I would not accept this. It cannot be so. I want to address people because I believe in the basic goodness in people. And I know in my heart that American people are good people. And they would never accept uh, someone who did anything to them to be tortured and incarcerated for no reason. So that's why I really want to talk to American people. I want this trial like that was denied me. I want to, to enforce it. I want to force a trial. So where American people and the world at large uh, is the jury and... Yes, I'm the defender. And that's one thing, very weird. I mean, every turn, like at my hearing, uh, the most important hearing, I think, it's a uh, habeas hearing. Mm -hmm. For the first time in my life, I faced a judge, not directly from Guantanamo because I was not allowed to go to him. And so, and so, First, it was like surreal, like the lawyers are discussing in a language that I don't really understand. So they use a lot of terminology that I don't understand. And in that court, I was the only person who stood to get hurt, no one else. And they were, I remember, I kept drifting away. So because it was really boring to me. <laughs> because uh, every once in a while, they cut me off. And then they say, you cannot hear what we say. Secret evidence. I say, okay. And then I come back. At one, in one instance, they were discussing AUMF. AUMF, 
of, co of course, I don't need to explain to you, but at some point in time, when I was in the prison, U.S. president tells them that there are certain people they need to pick up. So the discussion in the court was not about me. It was about the president telling those people whether to pick me up or not. There was no instance where they have the right to pick me up. That was not the question. The question only was, he meant that I, in person, should be picked up, or I was in this category of people over there. And I was really shocked. And in this, the same vein, so they, my lawyer told me, I said, I'm just fine, because I have nothing to hide. And then they asked me about my seized computer, emails. I said I would not answer anything about my computer. Lawyer said, why? I said, because this computer was seized illegally, with no warrant, with no court, with nothing. My lawyer, my good lawyer told me, you, it doesn't matter because you are not a US citizen. So I will tell my beloved US citizen to remember the story of the three bulls and the lion. For those who don't know it, so the lion conspired with two bulls to kill the first one, and then conspired with the one to kill the other, and then the one was not a problem for the lion to defeat and eat. So American people, if you don't stand by the weak people, the people who look beautiful, with very big beard, and Middle Eastern look, if you don't stand with them and give them just, and give them basic human rights, it's going to be your turn. This is inevitable. It happens in history. It happens in Germany, Nazi Germany. You know, at the end of the day, good, blonde, blue-eyed German are the ones who pay the price. You know, and uh, yeah, enough preaching. Thank you again. <laughs> and uh, I I'm really so blessed to be with you guys. And uh, yes. I really want to know what American people think. And I think it's like a rhetorical uh, uh, question more than anything, because I know American people are good. Um, I kind of want to um, go back to an initial statement that you made. <clears throat> and then I was wondering if Larry could comment on that, and then uh, Mohamedou could kind of comment, and then we could come back to you, and then you could. Um, you talked about how um, the first book, that we had to hold on to the first book, a little longer, mm -hmm. and that somehow the new version with uh, lesser redactions, um, um, if I remember right, you talk about um, this kind of talks about a formal clarity mm -hmm. of uh, sovereignty and citizenship. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of wanting to go to Larry first and think, what did you think of that? For me, it was, um, now I see both the books together. Um, so I was kind of wondering, having worked with the first text, and now you have the second edition that's come out. Um, so I was just wondering if you could respond to that, and then we would go to Mamadou, and then um, Kalyan, and then we would carry it forward. I mean, it's a really, it's a really interesting and illuminating statement in a way because the conditions of the first book remain, um, and they remain as they remain even as it applies to Mohammed's manuscript. I mean, to be very clear, the government has not declassified what was under those redactions. The original manuscript remains locked away. It's, it will remain locked away forever. Mohammedu requested all of his writing to be returned to him when he was released. He's asked for it all to be declassified. That will never happen, I'm quite sure. So that, that text, hit the, 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 the government's version of that manuscript is the, what the government says is the version of the manuscript. So I think it's important to absolutely preserve that and keep that. The restoration was an amazing process that was driven by Mohammed's refusal to allow the government to determine his narrative, even in that form. So, you know, Mohammed got out. Um, I went and visited him two or three weeks after he was out, and he's, he basically said, "What are we gonna? I mean, we need to get to work. I owe it to my readers to tell them the whole story. This is, I feel this is my obligation. I feel it's my right and my obligation." So. We, we said about, Mohammed who said about what we came to call this restoration, which was the process, they can't censor his memory. He's now a free man, right? Um, so he, you know, he sat down and he worked and then we 
quickly ran into really challenging questions of memory because as we wrote the manuscript 10 years ago, it's easy to fill in a short blank when you know it's somebody's name, but you know, there were multi-page redactions describing uh, you know, particularly two polygraph scenes that unfolded over the course of two days. You know, what was it exactly that, what, what parts of that picture did he paint 10 years ago as opposed to now? So, you know, he can talk, I, Mohammed, you should talk a little bit more about that restoration process, which I, I was fascinating. But, <clears throat> I mean, the, the restored version is the primary version because it's Mohammed who's story, you know, and I think that's really important. But I do think the idea of not letting go of the original in the sense that, you know, you know, it's the assertion of the, the United States government of its parallel narrative, and that's really what, as you're that's what the redactions are. You know, for me, when I was working with that manuscript, I couldn't talk to Mohamedou. Um, no writer or journalist has ever been allowed to speak to a Guantanamo prisoner while they're in Guantanamo. Um, I asked for security clearance I, so that I could meet with him. I was refused. You know, so I had to really work around the redactions. I was required to preserve the redactions. That was you know, condition of publication, essentially although I did not have to submit the edited version for approval, I was stuck with that. It was interesting because I came to see those redactions, I came to understand those redactions. They first looked like a kind of monolithic bureaucratic voice and then I became more and more aware of the fact that first of all, the redactions are a compilation of redactors, several redactors in each of the government agencies that had to review the book. So it would have been FBI, CIA, DOD, State Department. Uh, so it was censored six times, maybe. And each of those was by a person. And I began, began to see sort of the redaction not as a bureaucratic machine, but as an individual. And there's one example that I always cite where Mohammedou describes being led outside after he's been kept in isolation, not knowing day or night for months. Um, and he's kind of overwhelmed by emotion, and he has a Puerto Rican guard who reaches out and touches him on his shoulder and says, don't worry, you, everything's gonna be all right, you're gonna get home to your family. Mohammed said, I couldn't help breaking in, and then they redact a word. And then in the next sentence he says, the next sentence he says, I don't know what's the matter with me, one kind word in this ocean of agony is enough to make me cry. Clearly they redacted the word tears, right? <laughs> And I, you know, I, I remember thinking, why in the world is that a matter of national security? And then I, but you know, suddenly after all this time, I began to picture not a machinery, but a single person who was sitting there and reading the manuscript mm -hmm. and got very upset, you know, just had an emotional reaction and thought of the redaction process as one of trying to prevent emotional material from reaching the American public. So it just made a mistaken call at that point. But, um, so it, it is, I mean, I think the redactions are the government's voice. There's no question about it. The government's voice, I think, you begin to see is inconsistent. It's, you know, they, it's, it's sloppy. They'll redact something on one page and not redact it on the next page. Um, it's also a very human voice, but it is the voice of the empire, for sure. And so the new version is Mohammed. So Mohammed, say something about the, the restoration process. Can you, can you hear us? Can you hear us? Yeah, you can. We can. He's muted. Um, for some reason, we can't hear him. Uh, we've lost your audio, Mohammed. I think it's... Is there a mic? Um, there's a mic here. Okay. He can hear us. Yeah. Can you hear us? Did he mute by mistake? He probably muted himself. Did he? Should we try? He can hear you. So. There's no volume on that. So. Uh, let's see. <coughs> is Jeffrey here? No. Jeremy. Is, I think Jeremy's just quickly run to get the AV. Okay. Person. Ask him if he can check if you muted. Yeah. Can you check to see if you've muted yourself? Right. 
Any chance? Just, I'm just <laughs> 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 Yes. Yeah. Is, is internet connection is not the highest speed? So we might have just lost. Should we try to dial in again? Would that work? Could be shot. Yeah, it's, it is worth a shot. Yeah, maybe try. Can I can I get the the oh. expert to? <laughs> <laughs> You're probably the most tech savvy person okay. here that I know. Yeah. So, so we'll uh, we're gonna bring you back in just a moment. Oh. Right. Watch as I dial again. <laughs> I'm really sorry about this, but um, this, is, this is on here. Yeah. All right. Here we go. Can you hear us? Yes. Oh, oh great. Right. <laughs> right. um, Make it, what, him? You want to see more of him? Should we maximize him? Yeah, let's maximize yes. him. Yes. <laughs> How dare you? Yeah. <laughs> um, um, should we repeat the question, or were you able to listen to uh, Larry's? Yes. Right. I was able to hear him. And uh, yeah, like in a nutshell, uh, so uh, when I set out to do this, I thought it was a very easy process. Uh, and boy, I was mistaken. <laughs> because, you know, if you look into the... Uh, old edition, uh, they were like small blackouts, but there were like very big portions that were taken out. So the small things were not a problem, either names, places, or dates. Not the one you eat or the one you go <laughs> to home, the one you mark, day. Uh, so that was very easy. So I started with the easy stuff, and then I took uh, the book. It's somewhere here. Then I started just writing inside. And so I just started writing names and so. And when we did the, uh, when I did this, I I kept sending to uh, Larry. So where I uh, reached, and then I said I leave the big portion. I, I start with the smaller ones. So. And the scenes. So I remember the scenes, but I don't know where I put them. So, and, uh, and then Larry kept uh, back and forth, a lot of back and forth, because he, he was also fact-checking and helping a little bit my memory. And uh, yeah, it was, uh, to say the least, very tedious. But it was like, for me, uh, my, it was my jihad. Uh, by the way, this word is a, a keyword for uh, LSA. So it was my jihad that I uh, that I really wanted. I I I was so driven because I was so upset and so mad to be uh, to be stifled and to be silenced. And from the beginning, this all was about freedom of speech. So uh, during my uh, cross examination, the uh, Mr. Folio, uh, the prosecutor, asked me about, didn't you read these magazines? Didn't you watch these movies? And then I kept saying yes, yes, yes. What I want to say is none of your business. But my lawyer told me not to say that because it's not <laughs> okay to say cross examination. And then the judge. Uh, Justice Roberts, Robertson told him, stop this question. Not my lawyers, the judge. He told him, is this against the law in, in our country? He said, no. He said, why are you asking? I want to establish, he said, no establishing, nothing. He said, I want you to go for the jugular. But you don't have a jugular, do you? <laughs> and this is what I'm telling you is a record. So the student can go back and check this. So, and uh, so this was about freedom of speech. And I'm a firm believer that democracy dies in darkness. 
Why do I know so much? Because I freaking lived in a dictatorship. We know what dictatorships look like. I know what democracy looks like. Because as a teenager, I moved to Germany. So I could see the contrast between the rule of law and chaos. And chaos is never safe. It's never go going to provide any safety. Because like any type of violent groups, they need, they only uh, thrive in chaos and violence. And this is a given, this is very clear. And so we kept going back and forth until we have what we think is a, a restore this a reparation. We call it a reparation because we don't have the text. My text is denied. I cannot have my text that I wrote with my hands. Kalyan, do you want to kind of respond back to the initial question and then Larry's and Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so um, one of the things that I, I found with, that became really clear with the redactions was, um, as Larry said, that they were sort of not, uh, they didn't have a kind of uh, logic to them often. They were, uh, the, the very passage that you were bringing up about the tears, uh, there's some other, others like that. For example, uh, Mahmoudou restores that part uh, with the polygraph uh, exam where uh, him looking at the ant is sort of crossed out, right, for whatever reason. Or the a satirical poem that he uh, recites, and that's for some reason that's also crossed out. Um, and um, one of the things I think I'd, I really wanted to uh, think about, I want, I want to continue to think about exactly what, what Muhammad was saying, which is that democracy dies in darkness. And in many ways, um, this uh, Guadalajara Mudari sort of, uh, both versions, in fact, I think are uh, give us a, a, a register, an aesthetic register, and a formal register for actually representing censorship, right? Mm -hmm. And rather than talking about it abstractly, we can actually see it as in material form. Um, and to me, that is actually immensely useful and clearly something that um, other um, uh, artists are, are picking up on a lot more. Like mm -hmm. we have redactions being used in. Um, uh, Jenny Holzner used it uh, for, for paintings, and there are other uh, artists, uh, painters, who've used uh, actually redacted uh, files in, in their, uh, in their uh, exhibitions. But um, in, in literature, at least, um, this, this is really presenting, like with Sulma Sharif, a kind of a new vocabulary. The idea of the redaction is pr providing a new vocabulary, and, and, and it really amplifies that vocabulary. Can you kind of add on this idea of this vocabulary? Um, and I say this because um, the first lecture we had was Maza Mengis too, and Maza spoke about vocabularies of violence, yeah. about rep photographic representation. Right. Um, what is the point of bearing witness? Yeah. How do we represent violence? Yeah. And what is and then what once we represent violence, then what happens? So the idea of this vocabulary is something that is very fascinating because, um, you know, there are different people looking at it from different points of view. Yeah. So if you can kind of just unpack this idea of vocabularies for the audience, and then sure. we can kind of move on yeah. um, from there. Uh, and, and the thing is, so one of the things I was really interested in is how um, the various interrogators are, uh, are, are sort of blacked out for us, but we get um, a sort of more affective sense of their difference, not through, uh, not through their names, but through the fact that they, they occupy this spectrum of violence, that they can uh, both be sort of... Uh, really sort of benevolent to Muhammadu, and he, some of them he considers uh, kind of close to his friends, uh, and others whom he's clearly, uh, like, as, uh, as he shows in the diary, he was terrified of, right? Um, and and that, that sort of spectrum between, um, between benevolence and terror really, uh, for me, uh, sediments uh, what Sadia Hartman calls scenes in scenes of subjection, the kind of, uh, the, 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 the ways in which um, power is exercised, right? Like it's not always the over torture mechanism of torture that that uh, in, in slave narratives that produces um, produces coercion, right? It's also uh, scenes of festivity of allowing the, the sort of uh, slave to um, to to actually express his his uh, natural life. Um, that that sort of um, vocabulary, I think, 
becomes really clear in, in Guantanamo Diary that there is this uh, spectrum that uh, the redactions kind of make us, um, um, like, uh, really help us sort of access. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I'll just open up um, the audience for the questions. Um, if you're addressing the question to um, all three of them, then you know, just make it very specific. If you have specific questions, then um, be clear so that Mahmoudou can um, listen to your questions and then respond. I'll go with Something Michael. I wrote about but it's Michael. Uh -huh. Anyway, so when I started reading it, I've, as a journalist, I've dealt with redacted documents quite a lot, and you always assume that the redacted, whatever's behind the redaction is like the best stuff and the most important stuff. And with you know certain documents, maybe that is the case. But when you look at, start reading Guantanamo Diary, at first, you're like, oh, what's the, the mystery behind the redactions? And then you, they actually force you to look what actually is not redacted. And you, know, you get the sense that they really don't know what they're doing. Because you, know, you, you move your attention away from the redactions and focus instead on these really beautiful passages. And you start to you know, feel this whole human being. And that's the exact thing that undermines their project. I mean, if, they need people to see, you know, these terrorists as, you know, just a beard and a jork jumpsuit, like the passage that you quoted, you know, but they, they re didn't redact the things that are, are really beautiful passages and make this about a whole human being. And I'm, I'm wondering, Mohammed, if you feel, when you looked at the, what was actually behind the redactions, did you feel that they redacted the most important things? Or I know it was so important for you to take away the redactions and, and to fill them in, but do you feel like the text gained a tremendous amount by filling in the blanks? I mean, in a sense, it's who cares what the person's name is, you care that they're doing these horrific things, and, and that kind of comes through. Apart from your project, is it a better book? Uh, so, Citra, could you please uh, repeat the last part of the question? Um, Your mic is much better. Okay, Michael, you need to. So, Michael is wondering, um, do you want to say this, Michael? Um, I kind of lost the question somewhere along sure. the line. Can you hear me at all? Yeah, but your mic okay. um, is uh, breaking. Right. I, I, will, is... I will try to repeat Michael's question. Can, we, uh, can and... I pass it over to him? Yeah. Mike, take the Hey. Take mic. Okay, can you hear me better now? Yes. No, so basically I'm asking, you know, I don't know how, how much you caught of that or not, but, you know, for me, the experience of reading, particularly once I got into it, was that the redactions actually forced me to focus much more on what wasn't redacted, you know, and, and that there are some very beautiful passages and logic and agility, and what's not redacted allows you to see this whole person which is exactly contrary to, to what they would want in the end. You know, they want us to see a, a one-dimensional Muslim terrorist. But then you see this sensitive, witty, you know, beautifully spoken person. And I'm wondering, you know, did they redact the best parts or, at the end of the day, unimportant parts? Uh, taking it apart from your, you know, your drive to fill it in because it's your book, but do you think that it's a, a much better book without the redactions? I couldn't hear. <laughs> uh, anyway, let's move on. <laughs> All right. Um, can, I, can I actually say something? About yes, of course, yes. There's one of the things about the redactions that, it, that it, what they did in the original was that they, they redacted the, the people that Muhammadu was talking about when he was being questioned. And, you know, so he was being accused publicly of having links to Ramzi bin al uh, to Ahmad Rassam, who was the Millennium Bomber. And yet, every time they asked him questions about these people, they would, they would, um, redact, the, they would redact their names. And then Muhammadu, when he referred to them, their names would be redacted. The effect was, psychologically, that he was withholding something, right? But in fact, he was telling the truth. So the two, and it's not an accident that the two biggest sections that they withheld 
were polygraph exams, because we're really talking about his truthfulness. Those polygraph exams, we know because of the appellate record of his habeas case, they, they, he, he passed those polygraph tests. We have the polygraph reporter's um, uh, reports. What's amazing, though, when, when we you know, came to, when Mohamedou was filling in the story of one of those polygraphs, you mentioned he describes watching a line of ants crawling up the wall. And then he moves on to this kind of amazing exchange where the, the, the polygraph is asking questions to calibrate the polygraph. So the, the, the reason that the government would say that they're withholding polygraph exams is they would call this sources and methods, right? They don't want us to know what their tricks are when they do a polygraph test. Right? And so, but they, they, they're, they're going to ask you questions like, are you sitting down? Is your name Mohamedou? You know, is, is, your, is my shirt blue? And all of these things. And they, ask, and they ask him, have you ever cheated on a test? And he says, yes. And he, you know, and he t- tells this story about being in college and blowing off all his classes. And then at the last minute, bringing his book to, an open, to a closed book test. You know? And the poly- polygraph examiner starts to kind of scold him and say, I really hate cheaters, cheaters, you know? And then you know there's this little exchange, and he tries to defend himself a little bit, but he realizes that he's just going to look bad. But one of the interrogators, who was one of the females who was most abusive to him, has now turned completely in how she feels about him, and she tells she kind of cracks up while he's saying this, and she tells him later, you know, I cheated in college too. And you think about it, that that's the thing that they didn't want us to know, right? They didn't want us to know the character development of that interrogator. And you talked a little bit about this, mm-hmm. right? That there's these are there there are personal arcs for all of these characters who are forced to you know deal with the fact that it becomes clear that Muhammad is not who they were told he was, and the relationships that develop. So, you know, and that's that's the secret of Guantanamo Diary. The secret of Guantanamo Diary is that there were deep human relationships that formed with, between people. Um, and that was the, like that, that was the last bit of truth that they tried to withhold from us. So. so first, I want to say thank you to everyone who organized this. And I want to try to control my emotions here, because white tears are not really appropriate. But I consider it an honor to be able to hear directly from Hunter. And um, I, I have a que- I have a question that maybe um, Can you see it? maybe doesn't have a precise answer, but I'm interested in what your responses may be. Um, as I was sitting here, I I kept flashing back in history to images that I think are pretty widely disseminated now of like when the Nazis didn't like a book, they cut to the chase. They had book burnings, they took the books, they threw them in a pile and they burned them. And so I'm wondering from the point of view of legitimizing the American empire, they took away Muhammad's original manuscript and they're holding it as classified. They could have burned it. They, they could have said, hell no, if you want to get out of here, your book isn't going to be published at all. So I'm wondering in terms of legitimation of power that redacted or not redacted, why did they let it out at all? Because, because hearing Muhammad's testimony and knowing about the context of the book and seeing the book in either version, it, to me, is such an indictment of the abuses of American empire. So you'll talk about empire quite a bit. Mm-hmm. So I was kind of wondering if you could speculate in terms of why this, you know, they could have burnt it and they kept yeah. it, and then we could kind of go to Muhammadu again and then yeah. go back to a question. I mean, I think the, the part of the thing here is that like a lot of the redactions, at least of proper nouns and military uh, personnel, is all about uh, uh, withholding American culpability. Um, so I don't think it really matters uh, to the censors uh, all that much um, in terms of, like it's, it's, it, it's, it's an exercise where um, Cuba is sort of this, I mean, Guantanamo is this sort of um, space where, of empty sovereignty. Um, and, and as long, it, there, I think there's a logic here that as long as there's no, uh, uh, sovereign culpability, 
that these bo- the book can actually uh, be allowed to you know be, be disseminated and it's also part of I think what um, like with with Justice um, Murphy uh, during during the Japanese internment he was very uh, adamant that um, you know the relocation camps for Japanese citizens was were not concentration camps I think that distinction like of not burning the book and keeping sort of the benevolence of American Empire is at the heart of uh, letting us read this testimony right so so it's it's that they want like I think a lot of the times the US come like as as Mong himself shows in Guantanamo diary um, there's this sense of American innocence of being uh, you know, brave and free and sort of going around the world saving people, right? Uh, or at least the way uh, a lot of these uh, military personnel are narrated, um, uh, the guards particularly are narrated. And I think it's that impulse of distinguishing between a dictatorial regime and what is American empire mm-hmm. is at the heart of letting us read this so, testimony. So in a way, they were sort of legitimizing themselves to... They, I yeah. mean, it's like sort of an obscene bad faith where they were saying, well, we're, you know, we're not like them. We're not yeah. burning it. Right. Right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Mohammed, would you like to respond back to that? I think he's lost connection again. Mm-hmm. Can you hear Mohammed? So the question is, why do you think that they finally allowed the, the manuscript out? Can you hear us? He's but, but, uh, the printing of the book. Once the manuscript is out, they couldn't stop the printing. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, the manuscript is cleared for public release, so it's a public document. Um, I mean, I, I, can, can, can you hear Mohamedou? I don't think he can. I mean, I think it's, it's a really, really interesting question because it goes to the heart of the paradox of the American Empire, I think. But, but there was just a, there was a kind of inexorable process that went into this. He wrote the manuscript in 2005. It was written as material. It was given to his attorney, so it was protected by a current attorney-client privilege. So it was locked the, the warehouse outside of Washington mm-hmm. where all of the Guantanamo prisoners' attorney-client material exists. So it, the government can't destroy it simply because that's mm-hmm. that much of due process we've got okay. automatically ingrained. Mm-hmm. So it's sitting there, and for much of that time, his lawyers were fighting it as part of the habeas process to get the manuscript publicly released because they knew how important it was to bring Mohammadi's case to the court of public opinion. By 2008 and 2009, there had been two major government reports that had been published about prisoner abuse and whatnot, four major reports actually by that point, many of which, all of which have extensive sections about what happened to Mohammed. So by 2009, the US government could not pretend that the people didn't know that's the story of what he tells, right? So as, as his attorneys were pursuing this action within within the habeas case, it became very hard for the government to argue that the material itself as a whole was classified. So, you know, so by 2010 for the habeas case, then there was a whole other court record about these things. So I think they were in a position where they, they really didn't have a choice but to do some kind of unredacted or redacted version. The other thing though is, you know, I got the manuscript in 2012 mm-hmm. and people always ask me, don't you feel like you're doing something very dangerous? And I, I had the opposite fear, actually. I, I often felt like I had a tailwind. And I thought, you know, this was the Obama administration. Um, the Obama administration, I think, really legitimately wanted to close Guantanamo. Um, and I would not, I always speculated to myself that they understood that this narrative was really important as a way of, <laughs> as a way of changing public perception about the argument in Guantanamo. This really does humanize um, the story of Guantanamo in a way that no news reports could do. So I never felt that there was resistance on the part of the government by that point. Okay. Mahamudu, can you hear us? Yes. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, and um, I was just wondering, if, would you like to answer the question about why they actually never burnt the manuscript, but were okay releasing the manuscript even if it was redacted? Uh, 
I stand to be corrected. Could you please repeat again? Uh, the question was, um, unlike uh, Nazi Germany where books were burnt, uh, the question was the U.S. government could have destroyed your manuscript, but they did not. But they still released parts of them. I mean, they, they still released the manuscript with redactions. So the question was, um, why was that done? Um, instead of destroying the entire manuscript, uh, they still released the manuscript redacted. Can you hear us? The problem you break, I hear at first and then you break. Ah, no. uh, okay. No. Can you just type the question into him? Maybe. <laughs> okay. Can you type the question? <laughs> because we can hear him. So. Yes, thank you, Ian. I'm really sorry that. Maybe while he's typing the question, we could just um, kind of collect a couple of questions and then, um, you know, then have him answer all of them. Does anyone else have a question? Yes. Uh, kind of alluding to what you were saying about uh, you know, literature that's usually created in uh, captivity, having you know, being not emotionless but you know, sort of low on the emotion scale. Yeah. And here's someone who's uh, even till now and. He's, as you can see, maintain yeah. the sense of humor and, yeah. and, uh, and gone on with it. So, I mean, I wanted to ask him about it too, but maybe if you have something to add about that as well, and you know, how mm -hmm. you know how it's even possible because for the rest for the rest yeah. of us sitting here, we can we can we can not even consider what we went through. So, and to maintain a sense of emotion and a sense of self yeah. and a sense of humor on top of that. Yeah. Yeah. Did you get a question? <laughs> Did you get the question? Open your uh, your text window. There's a message there. <laughs> Should we try calling him again? So, oh, okay. from your perspective, the tech guy, you, I can hear you very well. Uh, <laughs> it's on the position of the mic. Uh, I see. Ah, I see. So you're so. hearing from the computer, I think. I think yeah. I think you're hearing from. Ah, uh, do you see that? Do you see the question that he just texted or just typed to you? I think you should ask the question. Can you hear us now? No, I don't think this is picking uh, up either. That's just to capture the recording. Oh, that's just captured. Okay. Um, earlier. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So it's right in front of the computer. Yeah. Is this, this whole, can you hear uh, me, Mohamedou? This, this really feels like an exercise. Yeah, barely, like, like, barely. Barely? Okay, so here's the question. Yeah. The question is... Yeah, if you speak, yeah, if you speak to the mic... Uh, beside the tip, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's very good. Right here, so this is good. Yeah, okay. yeah. All right. Yeah. So, so the question is, somebody asked. They, they pointed out that in Nazi Germany, the Nazis just burned. Yeah, look at the mic, not the screen. The mic. <laughs> Where, I don't see. I, dude. I need you here to do tech support for me. Um, you really can't hear me. Can you hear me? You can hear me. Yeah. Can you hear me? I can hear you. It's <laughs> this is a little bit to your left. Left. Yeah. This is my right. Like right here? <laughs> Absolutely. Oh. Okay. okay, perfect. So, the Nazis burned books, right? Why did the U.S. government not burn or bury your manuscript? Why, why do you think that they allowed it to come out? <laughs> You know, I'm not really expert on uh, the U.S. government inner working mechanisms. And, but I do know that American people are very brave. And they don't just uh, accept uh, everything the government tells them. They start to accept more and more. So let's not... Uh, uh, let's not be under any illusion. So, 
But I think, my belief that I did not matter in this, uh, in this whole operation of my kidnapping. So what matter, the few American brave uh, uh, women and men who stood up to the government and say, no, you want to keep everything secret in Guantanamo Bay. But we will not accept that. Because when I wrote my first uh, manuscript was in Arabic, it was a mix of Arabic, English, and French, because I just kept writing random, random stuff. And it was taken away. It was completely taken away. So, but after four years, when I met my lawyers, that's when I start to smuggle stuff and send it to my lawyers. So I think, so to sum it up, I think because some American people are resisting and demand basic human rights, that's why the government uh, accept to release damaged version of my manuscript. That's my belief, I think. And you correct me, I, I'm open. <laughs> Larry, can I harass you one more time? Could you repeat the second question as well sure. uh, about how um, he managed to hold on to a sense of humor and his humanity despite um, what he went through? That, that was a question, correct? Yeah. Yes. And the, the next question was how you managed to, to, to stay you, to hold on to your humanity, your sense of humor, um, and, and everything that comes through so brilliantly, brilliantly in the book. You know, when I was taken from Jordan on July 20th of 2002 in a CIA chartered plane, you know, <laughs> I, they put this diaper on me, you know, and then they laid, they laid me on, a, on a, a kind of sofa because I couldn't see anything, so. And I drank a lot of water in... In, in prison. And then I was dying because I want to pee and I could not pee in the diapers. I kept squeezing myself, but I couldn't. And then I just gave up. And then my only wish in life was to pee. <laughs> so thank God I arrived in uh, my grandma and I peed. So after that, <laughs> my wish, I peed on my clothes, by the way, so not exactly <laughs> the type of honorable man. So, and uh, after that, my wish was to not to uh, dishonor myself or my family. So I, I promised myself not to do anything that is against uh, my sense of morality or uh, that could uh, jeopardize my family. Uh, Larry, you met my family. You know my family. My family is very simple. They, they don't know this stuff, government, overreach, and so they, they don't know the government. They don't deal with the government. So we, the government does not give us anything. We are herders. We grew up in the wild, so in desert. So very simple, and it's very easy to uh, dishonor them. So, and I said one thing I could do, and the best thing I could do is to remain true to myself, not to be radicalized, because the best place to radicalize people is in Guantanamo Bay. You don't know how hard not to be radicalized and to adapt certain language and narrative of hatred and so, and uh, you know, you know, uh, like slogans against America and so, and uh, and things like that, you know. <laughs> um, we make jokes. So one time, this detainee, I was sitting with him, and he was very pissed off with the guards. So he didn't like what they did to him. And then he said, uh, what do you think? And I was eating some food. I said, me? Are you kidding? God bless America. Look at this food. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, 
<laughs> and he was very upset with me. <laughs> I had to wash my back for many days. <laughs> um, let's let's take another question. Um, this is for anyone who wants to answer, but I wanted to pick up where you left off on public perception. Um, because So I, I helped one of the curators put together art from Guantanamo, oh, cool. um, so I'm very glad you saw that. But one of the things when we were looking at a lot of the artwork, it's easy, if you don't know the context under which a lot of the artwork was created, you, 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 lose, you, you lose the meaning. Like there was the sculpture of the clock um, and one of the reasons the clock is really important is because a lot of prisoners weren't allowed to have clocks in their cells until uh, for the first couple of years while they were detained. So like not being able to t tell between day and night like really crazy. So yeah. time was very important. So in that sense, um, like contextualizing, um, why, why is it that there's such a there's such a schism between how, let's say Guantanamo diary reading it, and, re and reading about um, how he's viewing Americans as, you know, not hateful, not having that perception of being hateful. A lot of the artists kind of have the same perceptions where they don't view Americans as being hateful. And yet, <laughs> in our public perceptions of brown bodies, black and brown bodies, and the coming from the Middle East, we have this perception of them being hateful. Like, can you talk a little bit about that, especially in relation to um, what you were saying about humanizing relationships between detainees and guards as well? Come on, do you want to answer and then we'll do? Sure. Um, trying to wrap my head around your question. Uh, mainly you're asking what, why it's sort of the schism between sort of Mamadou's and also the detainees kind of more empathetic um, perception of uh, American life and the kind of uh, public uh, sort of experience of being a raised body that seems to sort of uh, that percolates discourse of uh, intellectual and also like public discourse. Is that kind of what you're asking? Yeah, like why is that discrepancy between the imprisoned body and right. American? Um, well, I, I, my theory really, I, and I, you know, you can, you can ask Mohammedu about this in, in person, um, is, is a lot to do with, as Mohammedu himself was saying, uh, in, in, the, in the context of the prison, um, you know, you have, it seems like in, in, the, in the text at least, you have a choice. You can either choose to have um, relationships that are some, somehow at least alleviate the um, the sort of starkness of the situation that they find themselves in, or to, as, as Mahmoud himself was saying, kind of be radicalized, right? And I think that um, it seems like one of the things that's happening in the diary as well as um, the paintings um, is, is, to, is to find ways to normalize um, an otherwise abnormal situation, right? Whereas I think that in, in say like let's reverse it and think about um, you know the the way sort of um, public discourse around American empire um, approaches the question of empire. There's we have the it's it's a it's a question of like the long durée of empire first of all right knowing that there's this dailiness of violence that's happening and that it has a longer history and so on and so forth uh, on on one level but also like it's that you know we're I guess the, the, the real difference is that we don't have to um, normalize a state of exception necessarily. I think our job here as academics, as scholars, is to kind of um, think about how to approach that state of exception mm -hmm. and to actually highlight that, right? Um, that's our job so that they can perhaps uh, find ways to, to get out of there, right? So I think that, that discrepancy is perhaps not that surprising, um, in my opinion. But also, um, I don't know if you've had this experience, um, especially when you teach young Americans, um, their sense of, again, going back to vocabularies, is that for them the idea, I remember using the word um, empire to describe United States. This was introduction to um, international relations. I was a teaching fellow 
Um, and these are some of the smartest kids in the country who get into these Ivy League schools. And yet for a lot of them, um, the idea of being referred to United States as an empire was mm-hmm. almost a no-no. Um, the idea that, um, and, and often the questions that they would ask um, are questions like, but why do they hate us? Mm-hmm. And I realized that that is a kind of vocabulary that has, um, again, trickled down mm-hmm. to people to the point where I don't think the question they're trying to ask is, why do they hate us? I think the question that they're trying to ask is, why is it that we are in this place? Yeah. But then since they heard the question over and over again, I'm, I'm just wondering, it could simply also be that sense of, mm-hmm. you know, the, again, as kind of going back to your vocabularies thing that American public is trained to a certain kind of vocabulary that mm-hmm. even with the language, when they want to empathize, perhaps they no longer have the language to empathize with. I, I wonder if that's something to kind of think about. Well, also the the fact that, you know, there is the legacy of slavery that even mm-hmm. Ramadu brings up, right, in the book. Um, so it's hard to ignore or hard to sort of uh, not not think about that in relation to, to ideas of American empire or even like dailiness of the violence that we experience. So. Harry? I mean, I think that sort of moves closer to what my guess would be for an answer. So when the, when the book first came out, when Muhammadu was still there, and I would do public events about the book, and there would be a Q&A, inevitably, one of the questions, every single time, somebody would say, you know, okay, I, I actually, I'm persuaded that he's actually a good guy. He shouldn't be there. After I've read the book, after I've heard all this, he really is an innocent guy. But he must be really pissed off now. Like, is it, won't, wouldn't it be dangerous to release him now? And I, I always thought that was the most telling question that you could possibly get. It's like, okay, that's a question that's born of empathy in a way, right? Or a sense of something, that a sense of guilt, a sense of shame, a sense of injury, of harm. Um, but my answer would be, first of all, what makes you think that personalities can change that much? But second of all, we have a whole history in you know, American incarceration of the exonerated of men and women who have served 30 year sentences who are wrongfully convicted and they get out and all they are is just glad to be home with their families, right? And grateful that justice finally came. So, you know, there's a kind of projection that comes from guilt, I think, that, you know, guilt is translated into fear. I don't think it's an accident that 15 years, 16 years after 9-11, the fear of terrorism is greater now than it was two years after 9-11. You know, because I think in those intervening years, there's been a whole history of terrible foreign policy decisions and you know, an enormous pain that's been, you know, that, that the world has suffered as a result of decision making set in motion by 9-11 that we know. I mean, the world, the Americans know that Guantanamo is a world of pain. They know that. Deep down, they know it. You know, and I think that that's, you know, so that the, the question of how much they open that, you know, how much they grapple with it, the, the less they open it, the more they feel fear and the more they feel guilt and the more they project aggressive aggression on the men who are there. I really, I think that's a, just a process that happened. But, you know, Muhammad who comes out, he's, you know, Muhammad who should be here, by the way, <laughs> we should actually acknowledge, we should say this, Muhammad who should be here, he's not here for a very simple reason. He doesn't have a passport. Because the United States government has not allowed the Mauritanian government to return his passport. Now, this, is, this is an extrajudicial punishment, right? He's never been convicted. He's an innocent man. There's no authority by which they're withholding his passport. But it's one last attempt to keep his narrative at bay, right? Um, so I think that's just, I mean, he should be sitting right here. Yeah. Um, so should we take one more question and then... And, and have concluding remarks, yeah. Sorry, I know you raised your hands before, I'm really sorry. Please. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to, just listening to some of your comments, and it seems like there's this process with the actions and everything. Could you, could you speak up, please? It seems like there's kind of a process, uh, at least from what I'm hearing from the other comments, that where it's like almost the, the urge to kind of regulate people's compassion and their empathy. And I thought it was interesting, and I thought, I wonder if maybe someone could speak to the, this idea that like, I don't know, it's almost like a strategic threat that they're like threatened by like someone's humanity. Where like in, this, in the process of like maintaining this larger empire, you kind of have to uh, to deploy like violence that like commonly you have to dehumanize people. So when someone kind of like, comes up and their humanity comes out of their own form of the book or 
even like conversations with the delegators, that that itself becomes like a strategic threat because it inhibits like, I don't know, the, the actions we need to take to maintain this political structure. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you guys could talk about the connection between, uh, I don't know, that right. kind of need to, to limit that kind of normal compassion public might be able to Okay, so um, Larry, I might, I'm, I'm going to harass you one more time. I'm sorry, it just feels like an absurd theater, but um, could you um, ask the question to Mohamedou about um, the connection between dehumanizing the subjects and its connection to maintaining the empire? Is that correct? Yeah. 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 Maybe how his guards came to see him as human. Yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah, it's a great, a, a great question about uh, the role that dehumanization plays in the process of, you know, the, the, the way that, that people are conditioned to think of Guantanamo prisoners as the worst of the worst, say. Um, and and how, how instrumental or how crucial is that to the, the larger American project of empire? And then how, how, did that, how did that interact with your experience with guards, for example, who were told that about you, but may have discovered otherwise? What, what is the role of dehumanization in your experience? Yeah, great. Thank you. I really appreciate it. <laughs> you see, uh, the government, you know, made a conclusion. They gave out a verdict without having facts. First the verdict and then the trial. So, but the trial has to come to that verdict, to the conclusion, so that we have the bad guys. We have them. So be quiet. You can sleep. You can to go to the club. No problem. America great again. <laughs> and uh, so. And then everything has to fit in. So we have to be sold because as American people, they we were sold to you guys as the bad people. Now you want to cash in. You want to get us. And and people, I, I, I've seen so many people who are very, uh, were very shocked because uh, one time, like I was, I was doing coffee and singing one time. And then one car came to my back and he wanted to give me something. And I was startled. And then I looked, I was very scared. And then he laughed so hard. He said, they told me you are a effing terrorist. That's what he said. And then he was just laughing that my reaction was very human. So. Uh, and, but we have to understand one thing that I think is Anne Lo, uh, Roosevelt, Anne Lo, something like that. She said that no one can, no one can humiliate you or disrespect you without your consent. I think she said something like that. So I think my biggest struggle in Guantanamo Bay it's not to be radicalized, not to come out like and say, yes, I hate America, yes, so and so, yes, I hate the world. And because that's exactly what they want, because they want to say, ah, look, we told you. And you don't know how many young like people from this region were very normal people. When they go to prison and they get humiliated, tortured, they come out very hateful people mm -hmm. and very radicalized. Mm -hmm. So the humanizing, this is, will prove, vindicate the government. So because that will uh, prove that the government case was correct. And me, I'm not going to give that to the government. They have to fight for it first. Um. Should we do concluding remarks from you and then we will close um, the session today because we're closer to the finishing time. Sure. And if you have more questions, I'm happy to email them to Mohamedou and, and Larry and then um, I will, if I can get your emails, I can again 
try and make sure that I, they reach you back because we're out of time. So yeah, Kalyan. Uh, well, first of all, thanks all again for, for coming here. I thank you, Larry. Thanks, Mamadou, for uh, listening to me speak. Um, I guess the, the concluding remarks I have are more like a question to you, Suchitra, because I know you're working on the um, on stuff to do with burden of proof with uh, Mamadou. Um, and I, I, one of the things I, I really want to think about um, going forward is just that, is that, um, is essentially how uh, these nar narratives uh, are sort of reframing um, our relationship to uh, the larger narrative of 9-11, of how, how both, like, me how memoirist poets, novelists are kind of um, uh, really challenging and pushing back against um, this kind of uh, almost like operatic narrative that the U.S. government has set up over the years. Um, and, and it seems like more and more uh, the case that um, as sort of American non-citizens, we have to start kind of worrying or thinking about uh, how, you know, the, the globe fits into uh, into a sort of a version of American democracy. In, and, in that, and at, at one level, you know, there's a lot of talk about the waning of American empire, but another level, um, we have, as, as Larry was saying, this sort of sense that terrorism is as much a, more of a threat now to America as as it was, you know, 16 years ago. Um, and and I guess like I, I wanted to ask you just generally how like um, how you know do you see the sort of um, uh, that there's a kind of persistent assault on the very the question of burden of proof with respect to um, non-citizens who somehow come into the orbit of uh, American uh, law, or in fact, is it is it that um, these are uh, states of exception that are sort of flashpoints, very symptomatic flashpoints, but somehow that that, that burden of proof, proof uh, sort of uh, idea can still remain intact. Um, that's a lot to cover. So, and I'm not going. And I know it's a yeah, Friday a, night, so yeah. I'm not going to take too much of anyone's time. I think for me, the burden of proof, the question of what it means when we talk about burden of proof did not start with um, Guantanamo Diary. Mm -hmm. um, I think in some ways, reading this book and then um, kind of you know preparing for this lecture has kind of maybe clarified my sense of it, but my idea of, of how flawed burden of proof within the Anglo-Saxon uh, jurisprudence started much before. Mm -hmm. It started when I was working for the War Crimes Tribunal for um, Yugoslavia and Rwanda, where um, it's this very dehumanizing process of you go back to people who have suffered the worst. They have lived through genocide, and yet we repeatedly ask of them proof that somehow um, that there was humanity to them. Mm -hmm. Like we ask the survivors of genocide, we ask women and men who have survived the worst um, to prove that they have survived the worst. Right. And this kind of amplified uh, when I then started working with um, Iraqi refugees and filing their uh, refugee petitions. Mm -hmm. When again, as a refugee, uh, as someone who is an asylum seeker, you are constantly told to prove your humanity, that your story is true. And often we would ask things um, to people who have fled everything that, oh, uh, do you have an ID that proves that you are who you say you are? Uh, or you would ask things like, oh, we need more details. We need more details so we know that what you're going through is true. Um, and then, again, it's it's kind of, and that keeps happening everywhere. It keeps happening um, in Palestine, where the Palestinians are supposed to prove their humanity. They are supposed to prove that the wall that's being built around, which is illegal, is somehow, they're supposed to defend the legal illegality and then fight, and in the process, if someone is killed, then, and you see that in Afghanistan, you see that in Kashmir, um, so the idea of burden of proof or what burden of proof as a very flawed idea has been something that's been in my mind for a really long time. Mm. And uh, for me, again, going back and again, reading um, Guantanamo Diary for the first time was a very visceral experience for me because then again, you've denied someone um, something fundamental. Um, I, I, I don't even want to go to the questions of humanity or the, no, you've denied someone the right to be themselves. Mm -hmm which is something I think even more, um, so for me, all of those questions go back to question, what is it? So we think of this, we talk about things about civil liberties and um, we talk about jurisprudence, we talk about due process. 
and for me, the whole legal um, bearing of all of this um, is completely flawed. Burden of proof, as even in the most <coughs> liberal of democracies as we practice, mm. always shifts the burden on to the people who are most oppressed, the victimized, which means that that for me is a question that I think requires to be challenged. So that for me is where someone, for me, so in some ways, uh, Mahamadou's work is kind of both um, the physical aspect of the fact that it exists and the fact that he exists as he does, for me, is kind of culmination of those years of um, um, not just disregard, that you start having these philosophical questions when you're young and then it kind of moves on. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to end this with something um, that I, I wanted to introduce before, but I couldn't. Um, so we have some. So we have a list of um, we have a bibliography printed out. So if, if people wanted to know more, they can grab grab and go. And then I asked Mahmoudou, what is it that he would like for us to add to the bibliography? And I was thinking that he was going to add a book or you know um, maybe um, um, something that he had written because I know that he's been writing quite a bit. Instead, he comes and says, oh, there's this poet called Ahmad Mata, and would it be possible for you to get his poetry translated? And again, I had I'd never heard of Ahmad Matar. Uh, he's not a very well-known um, uh, poet, but Mahamadou did know him. And in the process of going over um, the series of poetry that I wanted to collect, because there's no collection of his poetry, um, there's this incredible uh, poem by um, Ahmad Matar that says, a tear over the dead body of freedom. And it kind of has lines I felt, this was written I think 20 years ago. Um, I'm kind of just gonna read from it. It says, um, I want silence to remain alive, but all that, I, the, all that I come across makes me speak. Should I write that I am alive over my coffin? Should I write that I'm free while the letters are tied to slavery? And I felt that this poem written 20 years ago was in so many ways, um, it embodied to me the process, the conversation, the incredible people who have been part of this process. And again, Mahmoudou keeps repeating all the time that how his freedom is a result of so many people coming together, which again goes to my own question of the fact that while justice can subvert ideas of burden of proof, but the community of people, the demos, actually sometimes even go on to subvert um, that if people as a community kind of looked about this in a different way, then perhaps, again, it's harder, it's harder. But then, for me, those are the kind of things I would take away. And again, I would like to have more mm -hmm. <laughs> conversations with Mahmoudou and then, again, with Larry, because I think what we have is an incredibly remarkable book. Not only because it does many people have talked about its layering, about its empire, but the fact that it's so humane and it's the fact that... Um, you walk away thinking that here is someone who survived the worst, which often makes a pessimist like me think that there is a, a much better humanity, even though I think uh, humanity is <laughs> absolute, excuse my French, shit most of the time. But um, I think that's, I think, what uh, we need to take away. So um, again, I know we've run out of time, and, I, and I'm really sorry for the AV, and we're still trying to figure it out. Larry, thank you for <laughs> being more than just an, uh, an editor, being the interlocutor and the AV guy. Ian, thank you. <laughs> and again, Jeremy, thank you for and making I'll this happen. And talk about the microphone issue. Yes, it's, it's okay. It's, it's, it, it was perfect. It, 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 just as redaction happens, I think this was yeah. also a way of, you know, it adds to our layering of it. Um, it's very transnational, if, the problem. Yeah. Yes. Um, so again, if you have questions, I'm, I'm happy to take them down and email them to uh, Larry and Mohamedou. And hopefully, if they respond back, then I'm, I'm happy to give the back that something that is OK with Larry and Mohamedou. Uh, Mohamedou, do you have any concluding remarks? Yes. Yes, yes. I would like to thank you very much, Sotsietra, and thank you, Kalyan, and thank this very beautiful audience for having me this evening. Uh, I think now is tomorrow in this country. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. yes, and and, yes. So, and sorry for keeping you up, but then um, you know a round of applause for Kalyan and Mohamedou. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Great, great. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Can you? Yes, yes. please. <laughs> Kalyan, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And... Bye -bye.